So this week we are talking about ethics. Um, this lecture is usually um, described as being one of the, um, the favourites of the module. And in order for it to work though, you guys need to actually engage, you know, engage with it and do most of the talking in this lecture. So unlike most lectures where I get up here and tell you all about different subjects, um, it's going to start with me telling you a few things about ways of reasoning about ethics and ethical decisions. But then I just open it up to you guys and I'll ask some random ethical questions, or questions that require you to apply ethics to come up with like what's the right thing to do in this situation. This We don't have many people here in the room, uh, so this is probably the smallest group that I've given this lecture to before, um, but I guess we'll just we'll see how it goes. So bring don't, some people in. Sorry? Shall I bring some people just in? Just bring some random people in and we'll, you know, get them to argue about uh, computers and ethics. Um, so we'll, um, we'll see how it goes, but just don't be afraid to speak up and you know, put your idea out there. So what do you guys think about when you hear the term ethics? What do you think the word means? What is, what, uh, what's right? What's right and wrong? Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Any other ideas? What ethics might mean? Legality. Legality. Any other ideas? Like moral values. Moral values. Yeah, so there, there, there's a few ways that you can um, look at ethics and a lot of those ideas tie into ethics, but whether something's right and wrong, that's like, what is that like? That's how you feel, your feelings towards it. Um, and, you know, sometimes people bring up religion um, and then you have to ask, is it possible for an atheist to be moral, uh, to, to be ethical? Um, and some people say what well, this, you know, ethics is about societal norms and what's accepting and everything like that. And then you just have to look at examples like Nazi Germany to point out that, well, yeah, just because everyone believes that it's okay doesn't mean that it is the right thing necessarily. And whether it's like what the law, um, do you think it's possible to have something that's legal but unethical? Could be. An example? Well, uh, I don't know if it's a good example, but like, the moment with like Islam society here in the East, uh, and we do like quizzes, mm. where a person says something, and then we, we ask people, would you think it is cultural or if it is religious? So mm. sometimes people could think about ethics, but you know, that is ethically is right, but it's not really, or, or legally it's right, but ethically it's not right. Can you come up with a natural example though, of something that is legally fine by the law, but would be considered to be unethical behaviour? Freedom of speech. <laughs> yeah. Cheating in a pub quiz. Alright. There's a simple example. Uh, just harassing someone. You might not be breaking any laws by, you know, to, you know, there's obviously a line where you do start breaking a law. Yeah. But there's like a level of harassment which wouldn't be illegal but would be unethical. Um, examples with there was there was someone who won um, custody of a dog in you know after some kind of breakup or something. So yeah, so they, they got the dog and then they were basically goading their partner by sending photos of the dog at the beach and, and saying things like this is its last outing kind of thing and like I'm going to have the dog put down, um, basically. Shit. And, and actually did have the dog put down. So like last oh, really? meal, feed it the, the meal and to, you know, send a, a picture to the, to the person. Like. And yeah, nothing actually illegal about that. But um, clearly immoral and um, unethical. Um, what about things that are, are illegal but ethical? So, you know, I can say something like an, a um, laws change over time, right? So what about during the, the prohibition in the US where alcohol was illegal? Was it unethical to drink alcohol? I mean, we would consider, most of us would consider that not to be unethical. So yeah, possibly not. And I'm sure we can all think of actual examples that relate to current times, but I won't open it up to that just in case um, we say something uh, that we shouldn't. But, but there, are, there are clearly things that the law says is illegal, but that we would consider to be ethical. Um, so ethics is the st study of moral, moral beliefs. So whoever said uh, the thing about morality is, is true. It's about 
what is considered to be moral. But when we talk about ethics, it's also about that decision-making process. So how do we decide for ourselves that something is the moral thing to do or the ethical thing to do? Uh, and the, on a simpler version of ethics is sometimes like a code of conduct. So when you sign up to a society or a professional membership or something, you might agree to, to basically abide by their code of ethics. But ethics uh, is basically the study of whether something's right and how we decide. So let's start with something that we can all agree with, hopefully. So human rights. Human rights are inherently enti entitled fundamental rights that we all have. So the, the, you know, the UN, for example, will acknowledge a certain set of human rights that, that, that they can basically say, everyone in the world has the right to these things. So right to life, for example. It's not okay to kill someone, basically. We can probably all agree that's true yeah. freedom for injury it's not okay to go around breaking people's legs right you know people have should have the right to be you know have that physical security freedom from slavery personal liberty freedom of thought and expression so you should be able to hold whatever beliefs you like in your own head and um, be able to talk about those ideas to other people um, as long as you're not, you know, harming those other rights that they have. And privacy. So you've got the right to some level of privacy in your life um, and the ability to, you know, kind of have your own ideas and space and things like that. Um, so these are like standards that we can all agree with and that they, they are supported by well-founded reasons and, you know, there's a good reason for having these rights. But how do we decide when something is ethical? So there's a few pieces of terminology here that uh, I'm going to mention and are likely to come up in the test in, in the module, so it is worth remembering these things. But also when we get into the next part of this lecture where you guys are doing more of the talking, if you can slip in a few of these words, then you know, an extra thumbs up. So virtue ethics is quite a simple version of uh, ethical philosophy where you basically there's a set of virtues or rules and that they should be applied, basically. Um, hedonism is the idea that we should maximize pleasure and minimize pain. So whatever, it, it, you know, if we're trying to decide between two different things, we would decide the thing, the, 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 the option that maximizes good feelings and minimizes negative feelings, basically. Um, and there's all sorts of different interpretations of that, um, but we'll just stick with that high-level goal um, description of what hedonism is. Utilitarianism is um, basically maximizing the overall good to the society. So, for example, if we're faced with a decision like, do we kill one person to save five people? Now, if you applied you know, this way of thinking, you would say yes, because the overall benefit is greater than the, than the actual, you know, cost. So yeah, we'll kill one person, we'll save five people, or, you know, kill one to save a hundred or whatever it is. So it's a balancing act and we decide what's better for the overall society. So what maximizes the aggregate good? But that brings us to two different pieces of terminology. So Consequentialism is when you say things like the ends justify the means. So it's the outcome that matters and that's basically the same kind of thing where you make a decision based on the end result and not what you need to do to get there kind of thing. So you, again, you could make that same reasoned um, decision making process. So you could say, okay, if I kill this one person, I'm gonna save five other people, therefore, you know, the ends justify the means. So based on consequentialism, we would say that's, that's okay. Um, state consequentialism is um, where we do whatever it takes to improve our own nation. So if our, our nations, um, you know, the, the order of our society, the wealth, the population of our state and that sort of thing. So for example, you might say, you know, we'll go to war with someone else and possibly kill those people but in order to like secure ourselves 
um, you know, to keep ourselves safe. Um, even though more people might end up dying than if we just all lay down and surrendered kind of thing. Um, deontology is duty ethics. So that's like what matters isn't the end result, but what you would need to do to get there and whether that's right or wrong, like whether that is um, those actions are according to your own set of um, ethics, I guess. So for example, you know, if we want, if we're faced with a decision of do we kill someone or, you know, in order to, at that point, you stop and just go, no, because it's not okay to kill someone. Like, that, that's not okay. Regardless of what the end result is, um, it doesn't matter. It's not okay. So the same sort of thing is if someone's lying on the deathbed and they're dying and they ask you, are they going to be okay? So based on, like, deontology, you would tell them the truth because it's not right to lie. So you'd say, you're about to cock it. <laughs> or maybe in a nicer way than that. Um, but if you were thinking about it in terms of consequentialism, it's like, well, you know, it doesn't, you know, they're going to feel better about things if you lie to them, and that's the better end result. So therefore, you might say, you know, you're going to be okay, and then they die. Uh, and so, so the the different ways of kind of reasoning about these things. I think these are the last two pieces of terminology that I'm going to give you. So, ethical egoism is your right to do what's in your own self-interest. So, um, for example, you're on a boat, it capsizes, and there's only a few pieces of debris, lots of people scrambling to stay alive. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the, the law in this country, but I know that in many countries it's okay to whack those people over the head and kill them, basically, because that is the only way you're going to stay alive. So, you know, you protect your piece of, like, you know, you know, whatever, piece of wood from the boat. No one else is allowed on it because otherwise we're not going to, you know, you're not going to survive. You, you kill those people. Uh, that is the only way, if that's the only way you're going to survive, then some people would argue then that that's okay. Um, so you've got a right to do, to protect your own self-interest to some extent. But the flip side of that is ethical altruism where you have an obligation to help other people in need. So um, if you see someone being abused, then it's your responsibility to do something about it, tell someone about it and help that person out. If you see a pram roll out onto the street, then you know it's your obligation to leap into action and try and save that you know, baby before it gets hit by a car. Um, the law doesn't say that in this country. They say you always need to protect yourself before you protect others. Well, this is, we're not talking about the law, we're talking about ethics. So, so whether or not the law, what side of that the law is on, there is the, the, the term ethical altruism is about your obligation to help other people. And, you know, I think we would all, hopefully all agree that there are situations where the right thing to do is to help someone in need. So that, yeah. that's the term for that. Uh, so how do we actually apply all these concepts to make decisions? So we, what I'm going to randomly, so I've got lots of slides, I might flick through a few and choose, choose one of these things to, to talk about. Um, I want you to think about this in terms of ethics and the law as two separate ideas. So it's okay to argue about something, you know, I, I don't just want you to say, well, according to UK law, this is the answer. If you, you might throw that piece of information into the conversation, but I want this to be about the decision-making process of what is right and wrong, what is you know, ethical. And also, can we try and present both sides of the argument in each of these cases? So even in, so, you, you can feel free to play devil's advocate. So if um, someone presents one side of the argument, it's okay to present the other side, even if you only half kind of agree with it, just so that we kind of get these arguments out there. All right. So we'll start off, some of these, well, most of these are related to computers and not all of them directly related to computer security. So that this, in this first example, we identify from log files, the IP address of someone attacking my own system, so whoever I'm working for or whatever, the attack's ongoing. At this point, is it okay to look up the IP address of who the attack, where the attack's coming from? Yeah. Yeah. So, w is it okay to, dis to, to take that information to try and discover their location, the ISP of the attacker? 
I think that should be the first point of contact because yeah, well the other two you might start port scanning and then they, you know they stop it then you wouldn't know who it was and then the third one you don't want to just start attacking back because then you'll be breaking the law as well as them and it's not just about the law but ethics as well yeah so so you're breeding ahead on slides so um so yeah so you're saying it's okay to port scan them no you don't think it's okay to port scan i said the first one is the best that, option the first one at that point you discover the location or their isp and then what do you do with that information uh, well, uh, Tell the police, yeah. like get law enforcement involved. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Um, so, so it's not okay to then just trying to find out more about that IP address, scanning the IP address. You can, but you don't do anything with it as well. All right. So you scan. So it's okay to scan. Them. Okay. So, so you scan them, and then you find some sort of software vulnerability on their computer. Is it okay to use that information to get to get access to their computer? No, I think we'll wait until the law enforcement given the All right, you've got, so, so you're waiting. A few people have said that they would continue. So at this point, what would you do with that information if you knew there was a software vulnerability? Uh, I wouldn't do anything with it. Yeah. Because I'd be worried that they'd be better at attacking than... <laughs> you don't want to start a war that you can't win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so, so you're saying it's not okay to attack back. Um, and what if you do manage to identify the attacker? Yeah. So you get their address. Yeah, well, I'll ask them to come over for dinner and I'll work with them. <laughs> Strong Talk to them about it? <laughs> yeah, okay. like, you know, this wasn't right. Attack them in real life. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Run them over in a car. Um, okay. So obviously the legal boundary is probably at that stage you should get law enforcement involved um so and also one of the things worth mentioning is you might not have actually be attacking the attacker because like an ip address they could have just hacked into someone else's computer and using that as like a proxy like a, a pivot so they're yeah. launching their attack from a, a computer so if you it's quite easy to like think that you figured out what computer they are and who they are and everything but actually it's just another victim so okay, let's just. Uh, you could switch the webcam on on their computer and have a look base. Sorry. You could like remotely switch the webcam on on their on their PC and then yeah. look at base. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you've hacked into their computer and they've got a webcam attached, you could just have a look in the in the room and see who's there. Uh, certainly, that would be possible. Okay. So let's let's talk about man and middle attacks. So. Just in general, do you think it's okay for a network administrator to inspect internet traffic of employees in a company? Yes. Yes. So you work for a company, you have the expectation that all the stuff that you're doing on the internet is being monitored. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What about if they require employees to install the certificate authority certificate? So uh, a certificate on the work computers that allow, that allow the, the network administrator to um, intercept encrypted connection. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So at this point, you, you might want to reconsider whether you're doing internet banking from your work computer, right? Because the, the oh, people yeah. that um, work for the company can obviously intercept all of that communication, regardless of the fact that it's encrypted. What about if they take that this next step and said, okay, well, in your home computers, you need to install our certificate authority so that we can no, um, check that the things that you're doing is correct. No, thank you. No, thank you? Yeah, like, I'll be like, if they said that to me, I'll be like, no, thank you. Unless, unless it's a company PC, you know, like a company with laptops out, yeah, they're mm -hmm. fine. Wherever you are in the world, they have a right to you know, check it because they probably have their own data on it. Yeah. They have a right to protect it. Personal one. Right, okay. But what if you were doing work from your personal computer and they just made that a requirement? Um, I, I would try to work in like a virtual environment, like use a VM to connect remotely to the work one and ask them they could remote my VM environment, not my personal. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to present an alternative argument to that? No, I think that's right. Okay. So I said it back, but that was Alright, so the Kana botnet created by an anonymous author. It was some malware basically spread via insecure devices 
Um, so it, it, it's basically a worm, it spreads across the internet, it's mostly looking for part devices on the internet that didn't have, um, like that were using default passwords. And then from all of those computers that spread to across the internet, it scanned the entire IPv4 internet in quite a lot of detail. So it spread across the computers across the world. It did um, like port scans and things against all the different, IP, every single IP address in on the internet, basically every single IPv4 address and published the results online. Was that ethical? There's no damage done to any of the computers, supposedly. Maybe. No, I don't know. I don't so the, the the person's argument at the time was this is going to be the last one of the last opportunities to do this because once IPv6 takes off, it's going to be possible to scan the entire internet. So that, so this anonymous person decided this is the chance, the only chance that we're going to have to basically get a full picture of what is on the internet. Um, what about if I'm doing some research? Is it okay for me to take the results of this thing that someone else has done? and study the information that has been published. I think you have to cut the, if, if the person has declared it that, you know, you might be, you should be, you're able to use my results and everything, like copyright stuff like that, you know what I mean? Cool. If it's your research and you, you've done the scan and everything and published it, and if you said anybody is able to read it and edit it, then yeah, yeah fine, if I, if I just start like looking into it and I'm what do you nothing to do with it, that would yeah. be ethical. I, okay. Me, me. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's published, and they said that you know it was an anonymous person, but I assume they're not going to worry about copyright if they, you know, if this is the way they've gone about collecting the information. So I'm sure that they're, they're not going to be concerned if someone else takes that information and studies it. Is it ethical? No, to 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 take that information and study it further. You don't know what's in it. Let, let, let me give you another example. Nazi Germany. Um, did, <laughs> did, 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 loads of, did loads of like really dodgy, ethical, like scientific experiments with human participants. They did lots of... Um, For the better. Well, they, they did things that we would never consider to be okay. But the results were quite interesting and told us things about human physiology and human psychology, is it okay to use that information? Or should we like ignore that it exists? No, then you can use it because it's not you, not actually personally done something, but yeah, somebody's now already done it, it's not in your hands, so you... Someone's already done it, so use it. Any other answers to that? You think it's cheap enough to be ready, but you know, you know you don't think that it. Yeah. It's already been done, it's not really quite changed. Okay, it's been done. So can you can can you mention any of the terminology that we've mentioned earlier about how how you're making that decision? Uh, like it means means me and then whatever. Consequentialism. Yeah. Yeah. So like it's already done. The act of using it either is yeah. Yes. Um. Just so you know. It is basically considered to be okay by most universities. So, I, I, you know, like if I wanted to study this information, that would be fine. Like from like a, a university perspective, that that's how it is. The decisions made. Um, you can also use ZMAP to scan the entire internet itself. So you can, you know, I think I mentioned that last week. So you can install ZMAP and do a scan of the entire internet and find every single. Uh, computer that has port 80 open, for example, on the entire internet. Is that ethical to do? Well, it depends what you're doing it for, if you have a good intention, I think. It's all about the intentions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it depends what you do with it. You do not do with it. So. Okay. Yeah, all right. There is um, at least one country, I can't remember who it is now, um, where someone did get prep, um, prosecuted for doing a port scan. So, you know, in some countries that would be considered illegal. Um, but it happens so often that I don't think anyone would, you know, care that much. And I don't, I don't think that you, I, I, I think from a legal perspective, it's probably okay as long as you've got permission from the place that you're sent doing the scan from. Um, but yeah, certainly a little bit gray, a bit of a gray area. So, um, 
Okay. Tor provides online anonymity by bouncing requests between Tor nodes before they leave a random exit node, which makes it possible to set up an exit node and listen in on requests that are being made. So if I set up my own Tor exit node, I can see all of the other people using Tor and what they're trying to get access to. And I can even see, like, say for example, they use Facebook and I'm an exit node. Uh, could potentially, well, not so much now that they always use um, the encrypted connections, but certainly a few years ago, you can basically listen in on everything they're doing on Facebook. Is it okay? Is it ethical on tour to set up an exit node and then just listen in and see what happens on that exit node? Right. So not, okay. not okay because because they they have a right to privacy. Okay, so um, they have opted to send you the information because I mean they've connected to you as an exit node. I mean like it's been. They, they, if they're using Tor, they should realise that that's part of the system, the fact that it gets sent to an exit node. You don't think that's that's actually really a... Mm, I don't know. They probably, they might not even know that though. So yeah. It's still not, still not right, I don't think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the, I think most people using Tor think that it's giving them privacy. Well, that's like the, mo the main reason for using it. So yeah, I think you've got a legitimate uh, like point there, but there have been research done and published where they've done exactly that. People have set up exit nodes, analyzed all the stuff that happens on them, and then published papers and things about it. So it happens and it's, so it's not illegal, but couldn't possibly unethical. What happens if you break into a botnet? So a botnet, again, is, it, it can be like millions of computers that have been infected um, by, by some malware and often there's like a centralized service and not always but often there's like a command and control uh, server that they report back to uh, and say we've got a botnet that's being controlled and it's being used to send spam and it's collecting credit card numbers and things off the people's computers that's been infected maybe it's the, their computers are being used to mine bitcoin so it's using the CPU and you know electricity to try and make money for the, for the botnet controller. If you broke into that botnet and you could see what was happening, would it be ethical to, to basically notify all the owners of the infected, infected computers? Say for example, send out a, a pop-up message onto all of those computers to tell them that they're infected with the botnet. Yes? yes. It is ethical yeah. to, to, to basically interfere with their computers to let them know that something's going on. I mean, you, you don't have the... It's, 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 it's not deliberate. Uh -huh. you, you go to it by chance, then yeah. it will be right to send them information about what they are observing. Yeah, okay. So the, legally though, you don't have the right to access their computers. So by doing that, you could be breaking the law. Is it still, but you know, as I said before, law and ethics are two separate issues. Yes. So, so you, the argument so far is that yes, that's okay. Um, what about just sitting back and watching? So if, uh, if I wanted to do research and find out about what that botnet's doing, is it okay for me to basically not tell people, but just sit back and watch and see what's happening to, in order to learn more about it? No, I don't think it's okay. Yeah, yeah, you don't think that's yeah, okay? Yeah, Sorry? You cross it in the living room. To see back and watch what's happening. Yeah, it's not like it's a drum, you know, it's like, like a stage show going on, you know, you just watch it, you know, if something bad is happening, you try yeah. and do something, but like you said earlier on, mm -hmm. you know, normally if you see something bad happening, you know, in the normal person. And what's that called? What's that called? But if you're a researcher, you can sit back and watch to learn uh, something. Ethical altruism? Yeah. <laughs> Do the slides on your... No, on your I'm camera. making notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, okay. So, that, so does anyone want to argue the opposite? Do you want to argue the opposite, I reckon? Do I? No, I no? agree. Okay. Uh, does anyone think it's okay to sit back and watch? Uh 
Yeah. So in order to actually learn about it enough that you could possibly not just tell those people that are infected, but actually mm -hmm. take down the entire botnet or something, you're saying maybe it would be worth though, you know, sitting back and studying for a while. While you're doing that, people's credit cards are being stolen, credit card details are being stolen and all this sort of stuff's happening. But eventually, eventually it's gonna pay off, hopefully. Um, what about like patching the infected computers? So not just telling them because some people might not understand how, what they need to do to fix it. But if you have control of the botnet, you actually fix the problem, basically remove the, the malware and install software updates on those computers to fix the way that they were broken. Would that be okay? Yep. If you have yeah. Limited. Yeah. Anyone want to argue the opposite? It would be the same as the first one, really. It might be illegal to just go there straight away, but if you don't want to be agree to that, then it's yeah. alright. Yeah, it's almost definitely not legal to, to be modifying people's computers without permission. You're saying try and contact them somehow yeah. to get permission. Would you like me to fix the fact that you've yeah, got a bot now on your computer? Living a piss off, creepy. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, okay. So there have been, just so in case you're interested, there have been all kinds of studies that have done this. So there have been researchers that have um, they studied botnets and not and basically not done anything about it. Um, and so you know there are arguments about ethics around that. Um, so so the argument from them, from those authors, was they broke into the botnet. They were analysing responses to spam, um, and they claimed to be passive actors, which basic which they claimed didn't give them an ethical. Um, they, they didn't need to do anything because they were just acting passively. Like it was happening already anyway, they're there and they're just passively watching. Um, but that comes back to the point that we were just talking about, about altruism. So is it okay just, you know, is that actually a, a justification for not helping people to just, that fact that you're just sitting there watching? What about if you break into a legal botnet like SETI at home? Um, so, um, yeah, okay. What about if I wrote a worm that spread across the internet? Say I, I wrote like a super worm, like Dr. Worm or whatever, and it basically it knew about all sorts of different vulnerabilities, it spread to those computers and patched those security problems. Would that be okay? So I just set it free on the internet, fixing all these computers that are, are connected to the internet in various vulnerable ways. Would that be ethically okay? No. Because you might think you're. You're, up, you're arguing the opposite a second ago, though, weren't you? Like the, about the botnet, saying it is okay to fix their computers. So what? What's the difference here? No, I didn't say that. No, you did. <laughs> did I? But that was a different scenario. Okay. So in this scenario, is it is it okay? I think so. And why? Anyone? Still not okay. It sounds like it's, okay. Okay. it's a good. It's a good thing. Like you've got good intentions, but you're still doing it without their permission. Yeah. So it's, it's almost the same as like doing it's the same similar thing. scenario. But, but imagine how much more secure the internet was yeah. if we did this. So we wrote like a really good piece of software that spread across the internet and like fixed the problems that it came across. You, don't, you also don't know that it actually is secure. You, you might think it's a, a secure program, but it's still. Good. There's a possibility that I've made a programming mistake and therefore introduce all these problems into all these computers and think I'm fixing a problem, but actually yeah. by trying to fix them and changing the firewall rules, I might stop things from working and all that sort of stuff. So yes, you're saying it could have unintended consequences. Which was not okay. Just because you've got good intentions, so I mean, it's not a good thing. Yeah, okay. I think that's a pretty good argument. Just because you've got good intentions doesn't mean it's okay. Uh, is it ethical to hire the services of a criminal in order to study what they're doing? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> that's happened loads of times, hasn't it? Like with, um, what's that movie with where he uses like um, airplanes and stuff and then just a pilot? Catch me if you can. Oh, yeah. And then they hired him afterwards, didn't they? Because yeah. They hired him. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. I don't mean like a reformed criminal. 
like like like, an active criminal. like hiring an active criminal in order to study their methods. So, for example, <laughs> um, you, you might pay for a d distributed denial of service to, to take place so that you can study the internet traffic of what they're doing to figure out how they're doing the attack or something like that. Um, so, you know, the, what it means, it involves paying them, right? So, but, but with the intention that we end up fixing the problem. I'll bring up another another thing that I don't think is on the slide. So what about um, ransomware? So we talked about this, was it the week before last or something? Yeah, last week. So if you have, if you end up with crypto wall or crypto locker or whatever installed on your, on your computer and it, it basically encrypts all of your um, personal files and asks for, I don't know, like 100 pounds or something to get all your files back, is it okay to pay them? No. no, I wouldn't do that. Why? But I would lose my data because then you you know the you making them more brave and and encouraging them. Yeah, but what not to encourage them, but like yeah, go on. It's okay to do it and go do it to others. So once some people start doing it, mostly it's all about cloud as well. So once you decline it, yes, you lose your data, but you talk to them less. Right? You know, right. You yeah. So so you're it. saying it's not it's more import, important to you know you would accept data loss in order to not give them the motivation to continue to do it. Yes. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Any alternatives? You might be able to figure out a global key to unlock all of the machines that have been infected. Yeah, maybe, but unlikely to be honest. Um, if, you, if, you're, if all of your files on your computer was encrypted and you needed to pay 100 pounds to get back, how many of you would pay it? Show of hands. Oh. Look, it was twenty pounds. Show of hands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, I yeah, okay. I'm quite surprised. So only a only a couple of you. Um, okay. All right. So um, obviously, it the only reason they keep doing it is because people do pay up. So if everyone took that stance, I'm like, no, I'm not paying. Then it would start being a waste of their time, but I think that you'd find that there would be enough people to pay up to make it worth their while, basically. Uh, and if you're the one, and that's the other thing about ethics, right? Say you're the one person that decides to act ethically, like according to that set of ethics, and say, I'm not going to pay up, but everyone else is paying up. How much of an impact do you think you're having? Um, cool. But but then again, that if everyone had that argument, then you know, that's like the thing about throwing a piece of rubbish on the floor. It's like if you're the only person, it's like it's not that bad, I guess. But if everyone did that, we'd be living in a pigsty. So you know, you need to pick up your rubbish and put it in the bin instead of on the floor. So. so are you saying we should pay? No, <laughs> no. I'm saying ideally, it's better not to. Yeah. Um, but that, that realistically, a lot of people will pay up. Um. Publishing vulnerabilities. So if you discover a new software problem, a new vulnerability, what do you do with it? Do you sell it to a third party vendor or, the, or a government? Do you think that's ethical? Yeah. Why? That's what it is. So like finding a piece of gold, sure, like you can sell it now. Right. So you you found a new bug in Windows that will allow someone to basically get administrator access. You're saying it's okay to sell that information to a vendor or to a government because it's your find and it's no. That's how I see it at the moment, yeah. Yeah. Same okay. as like that ransomware, it's just like being held up by a, a gun, isn't it? Same as this, like just finding a piece of gold. If you look at it like differently, yeah. like outside the box, then it. it so I find it like finding a piece of gold, finding vulnerability, can make money off it. If it's not illegal, is it legal to sell? Um, no, it probably isn't to, in that in that situation. It will be ethical, but if it's not illegal, so yeah, so well, no, I thought you were saying it is ethical, right? That's the whole argument. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, what? If, so, which government? So, so, which government do you you know that 
you sell it to a vendor, it might end up in North Korea's hands. Wrong hands, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. But 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 maybe maybe it's okay. Morocco, it's sorry. Uh, okay. I think you just. Um, what about? What what about you know? Okay. So what about? Where, I mean, where do you draw this line then? It's okay to sell it to someone for money. What about using it maliciously yourself? So you now have a way to access most of the computers on the internet, right? Or like a, a large, say it's Windows, a large proportion of end users' computers you could compromise. Is it okay to basically get access to their computers to try and, you know, to make money? Because breaking the law then. Right. But regardless of the law, is it ethical? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, no. Even giving to the government. What about what about just if I was going to do a bit of Bitcoin mining? So that that might it might not cost them hardly anything. I just use a little bit of that extra electricity from each of these users that I connect to, and it's not going to change. I'm not going to change any of their files, access any of their files. I'm just going to draw a slightly more CPU to mine a few Bitcoin and send it back to me. So each person that I attack might cost them I don't know five p or something in electricity bill. Um, right. Is that okay? Still, no. still wrong. Still wrong. Okay. Um, okay. I think yeah, and I think we've talked about this before about responsible disclosure. Have I have I already covered that a few weeks ago? Yes. Yeah. So I won't. I won't go into that again. Uh, I will briefly because responsible disclosure is when you contact the vendor, give them some time, to fix it before going public with it. Okay. What about for governments? Is it ethical for a government, say for example, the UK government, to hoard security vulnerabilities to use in attacks? No. Yeah, because you've got dodgy little countries out there doing some crazy stuff. <laughs> Don't no. get me going on this day. So that's real problems in the world. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So, so, so you're saying it's it's okay for the government to collect information about a, a software vulnerability and rather than contact the vendor, just keep it secret in case they need it in the future to do attack. Keep everything attack else somewhere. secret because what's an extra little thing, do you know, what's a petty little vulnerability <laughs> compared to some little woman in a cave strapped up. Alright, so, you, so your argument is, is that it's for the, for, the, for the overall good that the government's going to use this information in the future. In the and same therefore, same, it's I, okay. I see government as we can do what we want, so I just think, yeah, they, it, if it's government, just whatever. Just, we don't have a say in it anyway, do we? Well, no, but we're arguing about the ethics of it, not. The ethics. So, so, I mean, clearly, the NSA do this, right? They collect, they, they collect vulnerabilities that they can use them in the future against people. The argument against that, because we're running out of time, I'll just say the argument against that is that it makes everyone else less secure because they found a problem and rather than fix it, they left people being vulnerable in case they need that in the future. So let's leave it at that because we've run out of time. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and I'll see you guys possibly later today if you're coming along to one of the guest lectures. See you guys.